Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Objective Health. I'm going to be your host today. Um, my name is Elliot, and join me in the virtual studio is my co-host, Doug. Hello. Hey, Doug. Right, so this week we have a very special guest. Uh, this week, I am pleased to announce that we have the co-author of thiamine deficiency of, of the book Thiamine Deficiency Disease, Dysautonomia, and High Calorie Malnutrition. It, this is Dr. Chandler Mars. Okay, so Dr. Chandler Mars is a researcher and writer. She's the founder of the health website or journal uh, Hormones Matter. She has a PhD in experimental psychology and a background in research in neuroendocrinology and women's health. She's written well over 200 articles and gradually, gradually moved over to researching medication adverse event research. Um, so she has a particular interest in the mitochondria and how nutrition impacts mitochondrial functioning functioning. Um, when she's away from her work, she is a longtime jock, a competitive um, power lifter, and uh, a part-time athlete. So Chandler Mars, thank you very much for coming on the show. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on. Yeah, thank welcome. Thank you, Elliot. Thanks, guys. So just reading that out, that's an impressive bio right there. Um, and it seems like you have a great deal of knowledge spanning across many different topics. And so you said that you had your PhD in experimental psychology. And so what kind of led you, what led you to that point? What led you to want to study that subject, but then also what led you from that point to actually go on to do all of the things that you've achieved since then? Well, it, it's been a rather circuitous route. Uh, to get the PhD uh, in the area of neuroendocrinology, I was very impacted, I guess you will, by the case of Andrea Yates. You may or may not remember this. This was, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago. She uh, ended up, she had postpartum psychosis. They treated her very negligent, negligently, and each time uh, she had a child, she became psychotic, and they would send her home to take care of her children, psychotic. Um, and ultimately, she became so bad that she killed all five children all five of her children. Yes, it was a horrible case. At the time, I had oh, probably three-year-old twins. So that means that that was 21 years ago because they are now 24. Um, so I remember watching that on the news coverage and thinking, you know, how in the world could they, one, let a woman who was floridly psychotic take care of children? Because taking care of young children, regardless of whether you're psychotic or not, is very difficult. And then what was the precipitating factor? And if you understand being a woman and having hormones and cycling hormones, you understand that during pregnancy, your hormones are exponentially greater than they are at any other time in your life. And then you give birth to children and they crash. Well, all of those chemicals interact with your brain chemistry. And so it's conceivable that that simple change in hormones from pregnancy to postpartum in some woman, women could initiate psychosis as well as a variety of other symptoms. And so I wanted to study it. And um, it was a long and kind of winding route, uh, but I did. I measured hormones in women who were late-term pregnancy, measured them in uh, immediate postpartum and then across the postpartum year and did psych assessments. And I found the hormone patterns that would precipitate psychosis. Um, and I thought sincerely that that was the direction I was going to go in. Uh, but then the economy crashed and, in 2009 and I'm here in Las Vegas and I had young children and I lost my job. So I had to come up with another way to begin attacking this problem. And Hormones Matter was born, and it was more of a statement than um, anything else. It was Hormones Matter, damn it, um, because people weren't paying attention to these things. And then as we evolved, um, as women began telling their stories, and as we started looking at the medications that they were given, I ultimately found my way to the mitochondria and to nutrition and to Dr. Lonsdale and the book that you mentioned and everything else we've done. 
Yeah, so I am a massive fan um, of of that. I mean, that book. I read that book <laughs> last year, and I will say that that book is one of the best books I've ever read. Honestly, I continually am back and forth, picking it up back and forth, and I think both of both of you just did such a fantastic job in that book and since then have come across your website and i think it's just such a fantastic resource um hormones matter and you know especially for the technical details you've got the technical articles but also the the individual experience of people who go through really terrible things but the main reason why I wanted to ask you onto the show was was really because you co-authored the book on thiamine, and I think that thiamine um, in in nutrition related fields is such an under acknowledged topic. It seems like a nutrient of such importance, and that no one is really talking about it other than you guys. So, would you be able to quickly just explain? In a basic way, for our listeners, what is thiamine? Well, thank you for the compliment of the book. I'm very proud of it. Um, and, uh, you know, I go back and read it regularly, and sometimes I'm in awe and say, wow, I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I'm, I'm very excited about the book. It's got a little bit of a scary title um, and a scary cover, but that was the publisher, so we didn't have much say on that. Um, but uh, what is thymine? Thymine is vitamin B1. It's, it's very simple. It's, it's, it's a B vitamin, one of many B vitamins that we need. Uh, it's, it comes in pork, a lot of meat products. You can get it in brown rice. You can get it in a variety of things. Um, and it's disabled by things like coffee and tea and raw fish and other things. Um, why it's not uh, uh, viewed as important is because there's pres presumption that we solved it. Um, because uh, most of the cases, you know, historically evolved in states of, of malnutrition, not necessarily the high calorie malnutrition that we have now, but the malnutrition. Um, the thought was that once you start fortifying foods with this, that you will have solved the problem. And so no one even addresses it. So why is thymine important? Um, the interesting thing about thymine is that it is at the entry point, at every entry point and around every portion of the cycle. It's a cofactor in how we convert food and the enzymes that convert food into ATP. So, I'm old. When I studied uh, mitochondria, uh, we, we memorized the va various components, but the presumption was that as long as there were sufficient calories, didn't matter what those calories came from or what they were composed of, the mitochondria were these magical black boxes that would somehow produce ATP. And they would go on doing this inevitably indefinitely, and, you know, no, not a thought was given. And frankly, I never got a, gave a thought to it. Um, until I met Dr. Lonsdale and until we did all this medication re research um, that was damaging the mitochondria. So the presumption was that, that, that you really just need your basic macronutrients, uh, uh, carbohydrates, uh, proteins, fats, etc., and the mitochondria will take care of everything. What is ignored is that to get from those macronutrients to ATP, you actually need functional enzymes and you need micronutrients, vitamins and minerals at each step. And there's like 22 of them you need. Thymine happens to be the most important because of its geographic position, if you will, um, and because of its rate limiting step along the, the various pathways. And so... Um, no matter what other deficiency you may or may not have, if you do not address thymine, you will never heal. And it's, it's not the only vitamin you need, but it's the one you absolutely must address before you deal with everything else. And I, I think that's the most difficult thing for people to realize. Um, and why folks, they'll go on these, these things with folate and B12 and this, that, and the other thing, forgetting entirely that that's so much further down the pathway than, than thymine. And so uh, they wonder why they don't heal. And they, they seem to think that, that well, it must not be the nutrients. You know, it's not the vitamins. I've done the vitamin thing and it's not working. Um, but they haven't done the right ones yet. 
So. Yeah. Um, The way that I like to see it or the way that I I found, I think you wrote this down in the book, actually, the the thing that helped me to understand it was that it's almost like the entry point. It's the entry point. It's like the initial step. And if you can't get through that initial step, then what what good is providing a bunch of the other movements? Yeah. Well, exactly. And so I think of it like a factory. You know, you have all these raw materials and the raw materials are the the macronutrients that have to be converted into the product, which is ATP. And at each point in the factory, the, the, the machinery in the factory needs things to get from point A to point B to point C to get all the way to ATP. And so if you overload the 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 raw materials it doesn't matter if they can't get in the door and then if they can't get through the different processing phases you're not going to do anything um you're going to end up with the same amount of atp you always do in which is usually diminished and the problem we have and this is why the title says high calorie malnutrition is because in today's society what we eat western diet is predominantly processed sugars um, and processed fats, but processed sugars. And so we have all of these calories, all of these raw materials sitting here, but none of the, the substrates that power the enzymes to move it through the factory. So everything backs up. And frankly, it actually does back up. It turns into fat and we store it for potential energy use later. So it, it, it's just a, it's a situation in which um, until you get that, that door open <laughs> and then until you get those different machines working, nothing's going to change. Okay. So, so you said about some of the foods it's in, so it's in whole foods or for Pretty instance, much. like <laughs> the, the grains as well. So like it's what part of the grain is it in? Is it in the, uh, the husk of the grain? So it's in it's in the the so in, in the rice it's in the, the the brown rice so the outside the husk it, it, yeah. the, the story the, that uh, this is Dr. Lonsdale's part because he's he's uh, historically been involved with this um, is that the 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 Japanese when they began polishing the rice is when they began seeing the thymine deficiency of course they did not know what it was at that point but they they realized uh, at some point later that that they needed the meats, they needed the the different nutrients, and and uh, um, excuse me, my brain is frying. Uh, they needed additional foods to to get thymine. They couldn't just eat right, right, white rice. And and one of the things I will I will say as an aside, as an athlete um, and as a lifter and I. CrossFit and all of that. One of the key foods these days that all of the athletes just absolutely love is white rice. They live on white rice. And I cringe every time, you know, because they have these these high carbohydrate pre-workout drinks that are basically caffeine and sugar. And then they'll have a protein and white rice for for as if that's and there's it's just a mess. <laughs> so 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 essentially when we're when we're removing that husk yes taking out the the micronutrients but we're keeping the macronutrients yes so we're feeding and the we're fire. making it pretty <laughs> yeah and easier, yeah. Mm. yeah easier to digest so to speak because it is quicker um uh, to some extent but um we've we've uh derailed our metabolism in the long run okay so so what happens when this goes on for too long, what happens? Um, so, you, for instance, if 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 thiamine is so important and people are low for whatever reason in our modern world because we have this chronic influx of sugar, refined carbohydrates, refined grains, all of these things, how can this how can this manifest in the human body? What kind of things might you see? Well, the the cardinal symptom is fatigue. Uh, and and as you see increasing fatigue or fatigue that is just unremitting, you automatically go to the mitochondria and you automatically should be going to thymine. Um, why we don't do this, I've never figured this out, but that should be your first thought. Um, but it manifests because it, it, it derails mitochondrium because mitochondria produce the energy for all cellular function. 
it's going to derail and manifest in these these bizarre ways based upon you know the individual's uh, genetic background their environmental exposures their history all of these things it's not going to be uh, a very systematic you know this exactly is you know thiamine deficiency uh, until it gets far enough along and you can see the classic symptoms initially it's going to be just weird symptoms you know maybe you have gastrointestinal system uh, symptoms you have weakness you have fatigue you have some memory fuzziness sometimes neuropathies you know a lot of just weird stuff will happen so even though if you look at the genetic disorders, even the genetic mitochondrial disorders, even though someone may or family members may have similar genetic risk and genetic pictures, the phenotypic expression, the phenotypes are going to be different when they express it, how they express it, because it's so variable relative to the environment and the diet and, and everything else that, you know, it's it's. In some ways, it's both the most difficult thing to diagnose, but the easiest, uh, because if you see something that doesn't fit in any diagnostic category or any one diagnostic category, you should be thinking mitochondria and you should be thinking uh, a thymine. Um, and, and that's just, you know the way it should be, but it's not. We like things in boxes. Well, that makes me think that maybe there's a lot of uh, misdiagnosing going on out there. That um, a lot of the stuff, uh, a lot of the disorders that people are having, like the first thing I'm thinking of is like fibromyalgia or uh, chronic fatigue or something like that, that um, those things, you know, could very well be like thiamine deficiency. They most inevitably are. I, mm. I would, you know, 99 to 100 percent because thymine deficiency, there can be the cause or the consequence uh, of, of derailed mitochondria. And there have been studies on, on folks who have done uh, high dose thymine who have fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, and, and it's, it's wonderful. They do significantly better. Interesting. Uh, most of their symptoms improve pretty quickly. Um, it just that folks are reticent to take it. In fact, we have, um, if you read through some of the comments on some of our posts about these topics, you'll see folks that will say, you know, that they've had 10, 15 years of, you know, XYZ symptomology. They stumbled upon the research. They started taking thymine and lo and behold, they can walk again. They can, you know, they can think their energy levels are up, their, their gastrointestinal uh, issues have resolved, you know, and it doesn't happen overnight. It, it typically, I mean, if it took you 10 or 15 years worth of ill health to get there, it's going to take a little time uh, to put things back together. But the stories are pretty remarkable once people find it. The, the question or the problem is, is that most will not consider it until it's the absolute last resort. They will try everything else <laughs> but thymine. And and it, it it's just it's it's painful to watch, frankly. Yeah, as I said at the start of the um, start of this interview, no one talks about this. Like, no. honest, out no. of all of the the natural health experts, like, honestly, when I came across your book, it was like a complete breath of fresh air because it's just. I, I studied nutrition. I learned all about the vitamins and the middle, minerals and everything, but we had very little education on thiamine. Yeah. But then actually looking, you know, reading through the functions, you know, how it's just so important for, you know, every single cell, but particularly in the nervous system and whatnot. Exactly. And you would think that if there was any kind of neurological dysfunction, then someone might actually think to use thiamine, but they don't. And so reading through some of the case studies absolutely just, you know, blew me away. Um, I'd like to know if, like you've said, some of the people who who, who read your comment on, on Hormones Matter on the website, that they've seen benefits. Um, are there any particular kind of um, cases that you can recall or that particularly stood out to you um, that you that you know of? Any stories where there, you know, someone's taken thiamine and they've seen like really good benefits? Well, it, uh, there's a lot of them. <laughs> um, there, there are a number of them. Um, I, I think uh, there's one that's ongoing right now. In fact, she just emailed me today, uh, someone who has MS uh, and has been 
a variety of other conditions has been suffering for years was uh, unable to walk her balance was horrible her her eyesight had been uh, becoming pro problematic and a whole host of other things and she she texted me this morning and she said uh, she's taking two grams of thiamine of, of, of allothiamine a day, which is a huge dose. Um, but she says she feels fantastic wow. first time in her life. Um, and, and she, she was starting to get better at one gram, uh, which is again, an enormous dose. And this was about a month and a half ago. She had texted me, she goes, I'm up to one gram and you know, the ataxia, the memory difficulties, the balance, all of these things are starting to resolve. And she texted me this morning, she's up to two grams and she says she feels like a new person. Um, and so that's, that's just remarkable. Um, but it's not uncommon. Again, you read through the comments and, and you see, you know, this happen with various manifestations of, of the deficiency because they are, a lot of them are so different from each other. You think that this can't possibly be the same vitamin <laughs> affecting all of these things. And it is because of its position and its role in the mitochondria and because the mitochondria are responsible for not only energy production, which is, you know, certainly the predominant function of them, but they, they are responsible for steroidogenesis. They're responsible for calcium management. They're responsible for potassium management. They signal and, and, and manage immune, immune function and inflammatory responses. And, you know, they are central to health and disease period. And if they are not working up to speed, if they are just marginally inefficient, then they set off these, these uh, you know, adaptive cascades that are meant to be short term, that are meant to keep you alive. But if they continue on and you continue in this deficit, for long enough, you get the balance between healthy and unhealthy get skewed and you get death spirals in the, the mitochondria and your illnesses get worse and so on and so forth. Uh, but really, all you need to do is start feeding the mitochondria and they will start unwinding all of those adaptive mechanisms over time because I'm going to anthropomorphize this. They want you to live. They, mm. they, you know, their job is to keep you alive and they will do whatever it takes to keep you alive, despite whatever you may do to them. <laughs> right. So if you were to tell a conventional medical doctor that you were taking two grams of thiamine, they'd probably <laughs> they think you're crazy. Yeah, so, right, <laughs> you, you do touch upon this on your book, and I, I just, I'm fascinated by this concept. Um, so, if someone, right, a, a scenario, if someone is chronically deficient, and their kind of adaptive systems, you know, they're, they're, the functions which rely on thiamine start to become kind of down-regulated. It's almost yeah. like the body starts to adapt to a lower availability of this nutrient. Mm -hmm. Things start to slow down you speak about in your book about how high doses are sometimes needed to kind of kickstart those functions back again. Like just, just a, just a standard RDA dose is not going to work. Oh, certainly not. Well, the RDA DA is just meant to keep you alive, bare right. minimum survival. <laughs> you know, it's not meant to keep you healthy. It's, it's to keep you breathing for the most part. Um, mm. But there's, there's with the dosing is interesting. Um, and I, and this, Dr. Lonsdale goes into this a a bit uh, in the book, um, you do need a higher dose to kickstart, but you also risk with folks who have been chronically or severely deficient, what he terms a paradoxical reaction. Um, they get worse. Uh, things start in, to kick into gear, particularly those who have had predominantly cardiac symptoms. That's where you, you have some problems, um, where you get heart palpitations, you, you get increased heart rate, you get irregularities in heart rhythm, um, and things that can be somewhat, not only troubling, but can be somewhat dangerous. And so ideally, if you were to go the high dose route immediately, you would be doing so under the care of a physician who understood what was going to happen um, and could help you manage it. Now, that doesn't happen. So folks have to navigate this on their own. And so we tell them to titrate up 
slowly <laughs> over time so that they can uh, withstand some of those and, and modulate some of those potential re reactions. And they typically, if they're going to happen, they happen pretty immediately and then they last for a long time. So it is a struggle um, that they have to go through. Um, but if they make it through a, a week or so of, of dosing and just at the simple 50 milligrams P TTF day and don't have any problems, then they go up to 100 and they don't have any problems, then we're, we're going to knock on wood likely be okay. That doesn't like necessitate that you absolutely always are, but it's, it's a good indicator. But if they start having a reaction pretty quickly, then you know you're going to have a couple weeks to a couple months of struggle while they get up to the speed they need. And, and it's going to be difficult. They're going to feel horrible. Some of them do feel horrible. Um, that's, some don't. But so, that's... Go ahead. Sorry. No, you just mentioned uh, TTFD. Yeah. And just for yes. the listeners who don't know, um, there are multiple different uh, types of thiamine, right? So Certainly. would you just be able to briefly explain that just for people? Okay, who don't so the, the, the standard thiamine that you would get over the, well, over almost everything's over the counter that you would get in a supermarket or in a vitamin is, is thiamine hydrochloride. That's the same kind that you would get if you were to do IV thiamine. Um, and I, it is great if that's all you can get that's what you've got to do but if you have transporter issues uh meaning the 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 transporters that will will take the thymine into the cell or if you're severely deficient or you have other issues uh, a version of it um is ttfd it comes in the brand names are allothiamine or lipothiamine uh, lipothiamine has uh, alpha lipoic acid with it because you need that in one of the uh, subunits of the enzyme doesn't matter but that's a, a, a form of thymine that will cross the cell wall, the mitochondria, without the transporters. It's easier. They call it a fat soluble, but it's a water soluble vitamin, so it's not technically fat soluble. It's just not as transporter dependent as the, the HCL. So you have that. You have bimphothiamine, um, which is a different derivative, and I can't remember the, the abbreviation of it. But it is um, great for some instances, works really well in the periphery, but does not cross the blood-brain barrier. And if you have a lot of neurological symptoms, then you're going to want the TTFT version to get across the, the, the blood-brain barrier. Um, and I think those are the, the three main ones that, that we have. They all have different brands, uh, but those are the major ones. Having said that, though, um, there is work with bimphothiamine in children with Down syndrome, which is, you know, they've got a lot of neurological issues. Um, and they are able to, with the bimphothiamine, even though perhaps it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, they do see improvement in the neurological uh, performance. So uh, by what mechanism, I don't know. Uh, but uh, folks have been using that. Uh, there's colleagues of mine that use that with children, and primarily because it tastes better. Um, the allothiamine and the lipothiamine apparently taste horrid if you open up the capsule and try to put it in a smoothie <laughs> or something for a kid. <laughs> Um, they need to develop sublingual and, and other types of, 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 of delivery methods for children, and they haven't. Um, but, yeah. I, I had a couple of – oh, sorry. Go ahead, Doug. No, I, well, I was just going to ask because you, um, you had mentioned the, the IV um, – um, they're using intravenous uh, uh, thiamine. So a thiamine HCL is the is the form that you would find the uh, the intravenous stuff in. Does that mean that the intravenous would not be as good as maybe like TTFD? Well, intravenous would be better uh, okay. it, just in general. The format is because it's, you're bypassing uh, the liver and, and other things and it's going directly. Now, one of the, the things that uh, Dr. Lonsdale recommends is, is doing... 
other nutrients with the thymine. You can do mm. the, the thymine alone and you often will need more thymine, but doing a, a cocktail of, of the full complement because it, generally folks, if they're thymine deficient, they've got a lot of other deficiencies going on too. Sure, yeah. Um, and so I like the idea of doing IV. If we could get uh, more folks to do IV, more not... Uh, more practitioners to mm-hmm. offer that and to have it not be a boutique specialty, high cost, yeah. you know, uh, endeavor. I think that that would be a great way to go for some of these uh, individuals who have absorption issues, even with the TTFD and who need everything. <laughs> yeah. Cause I do have a, a friend who's actually a medical doctor and she actually <laughs> requested that I ask you this. She can only find, she's in Europe and can only find um, intramuscular um, injectable stuff. And she wanted to know if that would be appropriate for doing intravenously. Do you, do you know? Well, it, I, from what I understand, the intramuscular hurts like crazy. Oh. Um, and, but it has been used a lot with, again, MS, MS patients. I know a physician who uses it with his MS patients quite a bit. Um, but it, it is very painful from what Mm. I understand. So, uh, I, I don't know. IV would be great if you could do it intramuscularly, if you can't, um, but it, most of the research is with MS patients. Okay. There's there's also the Orthia cream, isn't there? I've had a couple of clients who use that and they say it absolutely stinks. <laughs> okay, I, I haven't used it. I actually okay. just heard of the cream today. Um, right. There was a, a discussion where they were looking for something and uh, someone mentioned to, to – apparently there's one for, for post-alcohol, um, uh, for hangovers. <laughs> Uh, too. So, uh, yes, uh, I, I don't know much about that. It, it, whether it stinks or not, um, you know, n- irrelevant. I mean, irrelevant, <laughs> but uh, how much of it is absorbed? Because thiamine is, is, is water soluble. Uh, the TTFD is not water. I mean, it's water soluble, uh, even though they call it fat soluble, but it's a different mechanism. So I don't think that that would apply to a, a skin based application. And most of the skin based applications work best with fat soluble, you know, steroids, you can do steroids in a patch, or anything like that. But I don't know. So I don't know the the kinetics of that, and how well it works. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, Okay, so so you were saying before about how, like in our modern world, we have, you know, our modern diets, the way that we're eating now is changed so drastically, we destroy our food. And this, I mean, this is a clear factor which predisposes someone to easily running through their thiamine stores because thiamine is water soluble. Yeah. So it's yeah. like you can run through it fairly quickly and produce a deficit. But what other kind of things? Um, might predispose one to actually being low in this vital nutrient? Well, medications. Uh, I mean, all pharmaceuticals uh, attack the mitochondria by some mechanism or another. Uh, All pharmaceuticals leach some vitamins and minerals. You know, they vary between pharmaceuticals. Um, And so the more pharmaceutically based uh, your lifestyle is, the more likely that you are going to have difficulty not only with mitochondrial function because you have severe damage, but with nutrient status. Um, And so it becomes kind of a a cyclical thing. You know, you, you, you have poor nutrition, you need pharmaceuticals or you get pharmaceuticals, which damage the mitochondria, which sucks out more nutrients, which gives you more symptoms. So you think you need more medications and you just keep going. It's a great business model, Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's not particularly effective for health. So some of the, the, the key ones that everybody's on, you know, metformin. Metformin is a, is a thymine analog in a way that, that when metformin is present, thymine can't get in. Um, huh. So, yeah. Yeah. So, wow. You know, That's so think funny. about this. You have type 2 diabetics who are typically, and type 1 diabetics who are like 70% di- thymine deficient. There's it's huge number of diabetics 
have uh, thiamine problems. Then you give them metformin. And metformin not only takes the thiamine and, and blocks it from entering the cell, but it also uh, depletes CoQ10, uh, damages the electron transport uh, uh, chain, um, reduces ATP, at least in rats, by something like 48%, um, huh. increases. Yeah, so it's like this drug that, that basically makes you worse. But it does lower your blood sugar. So it's, it's, you know, and allows you to eat cake. Um, (laughs) But, you know, it it doesn't help you to become healthy as much as the the advocates of metformin think it's a wonder drug. Yeah, um, it's generally thought of as harmless, too. Like, I I see people write about that all the time. Oh, yeah, there's no side effects. That's actually a really, really safe drug. (laughs) No, yeah, there's, it's not. Um, uh, you end up with a lot of fatigue. Uh, neuromuscular issues are, are big. Um, memory fogginess. Blah, blah, blah. I can tell you a personal story on metformin. Um, my mom, who's 70 something at this point, uh, but all her life it had been on a gazillion medications like any person. And, and, and I gradually got her off all of these medications and she was healthy for a couple of years, did great exercise, let her diet go a little bit. The doctor put her back on metformin, which she had previously been on for probably 20 years, and, mm. but had been off it for, I don't know, three or four years at this point. Within three weeks, she was walking into walls and couldn't oh. stand up and had, you know, just fell apart. So, and she wouldn't listen to me, you know, because she's, she, parents don't. Yeah. And, yeah. and so we got her back off, we got her thymine levels back up and, you know, she was fine, but the, it was so, she couldn't, she couldn't walk straight. She, she had, she lost all ability to balance. She had the drunk man walk and was very fuzzy and, and weak and everything. And it took three weeks. Now, why it took three weeks this time and she had been on it 20 years before and didn't have that particular issue i don't know uh but uh it it was it was noticeable um so yeah and a lot of people the first time they get on it they'll they'll mention that and maybe they adapt to it over time um because thymine stores are interesting in that that we have two weeks of absolute stores meaning if we like completely eliminated from our diet and had no thymine whatsoever for two weeks that's how long it would take. But nobody's like that. Things wax and wane. You have good days where you, 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 know, you eat well and, and you have bad days. And so symptoms wax and wane with that. But over time, it all catches up. Mm. And, and aside from, from the medications, um, what do you think about many of the, I mean, I think I probably know what you're going to say. <laughs> Many of the other chemicals that we come into contact with, like, I mean, I think in the book, you, you know, you spoke about glyphosate, but there's also many of the kind of petrochemicals and stuff that they're spraying yeah. on the food or anything. Well, certainly. Yeah, it's it's not a good situation. And that's actually what my next book is about. Um, it, it's called Not Quite Fatal. Um, and it's it, this presumption we have that so long as something doesn't kill us immediately, that it, it is safe. And that's how we view all of these these chemicals that we spray on our food and we tout the economic benefits and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but none of them really kill us immediately. They institute small changes that accrue over time and that make us very, very sick eventually and then make our offspring sick. Um, and so it's certainly organic, but the regulations on organic are changing at least in the U.S. because of our current yeah. administration. So they're, they're unwinding a lot of those things. But what that the spraying, the overuse of those agrochemicals has done to the food is depleted the soils of, of minerals. Uh, and so the soils are, are, are basically sterile at this point and depleted the, the foods that grow in them of necessary vitamins and minerals. And so the, if you eat a diet, even if you eat like, you know, I eat lots of fruits and vegetables, but they're conventionally grown, you're not likely to get the nutrients that you need because they're grown in depleted soils and they're, you know, sprayed with all these toxins, which becomes a, a, a net deficit in energy because you 
don't get the nutrients and then you have to deal with all the toxicants on top of it. So it, it behooves people who are ill, um, uh, be great if everybody did it so they didn't get ill, but if you are ill to eat absolutely as cleanly as humanly possible in today's environment um, to rebuild your body. That, and that brings me on to the, to the next question actually. So, so from what I gather, eating a diet high in sugar is probably not a good idea. Yeah? <laughs> no. but, but there's lots of other diets that aren't high in refined sugar. Um, what kind of diet or dietary template, it may be completely individual, but is there any particular dietary template that you would think is beneficial for um, maintaining or providing our body with, with, with thiamine? Well, certainly more protein because that's one of your major sources. And I, I see that particularly in women uh, that we've been scared off of protein since time immemorial because protein makes you fat. And so women tend to not eat anything but low calorie carbohydrate based stuff. Uh, so I, that's one of the things that, that when I'm dealing with folks uh, who are ill is the most difficult thing to get them to consider is to actually eat protein. Lots of it. Um, fat is the second one. We need fats. Again, women will not eat fat to save their lives. Mm -hmm. So you've got to, to really insulate. And then fruits and vegetables, primarily vegetables. Uh, you'll have a lot of people who will eat fruits only and think that that's, that's sufficient. It's not. Those are still carbohydrates. They're better carbohydrates, certainly, than sugars um, and processed foods, but vegetables uh, are, are better for you. Uh, so those are the key things in whole foods. You know, uh, you eliminate all processed foods to the extent that is humanly possible and, and eat food. I mean, it, it's not rocket science. It, it really is. Someone, <laughs> someone, I was chatting with someone who, who has recovered but then had a relapse uh, because uh, uh, she, she took a supplement that, that uh, ended up making her worse. Uh, everybody's looking for that supplement, you know, this magic pill. And, and it's natural. It's human nature. You're not quite fully recovered. You think, well, if I take this, it'll expedite things. Um, it doesn't. Um, but we were chatting about this and now that she's gotten back on track and she's got her thiamine doses up and she's doing, she's, she's needing to start exercising and, uh, uh, moving and it's, it's like, take it slow. You have to build a base with everything you do. This is not something that is, that is, um, that you go out there and you, you go, you know, a full-on workout. It's not something that you can fix immediately. You have to build your body's capacity up over time. And just like you do with the nutrients, you build things up over time so that systems can unwind. Um, and she commented and she goes, you're just entirely too practical. Um, and I, I'm like, yeah, that's all it is. People think that it's very complicated, <laughs> uh, but it's really not. If, if you become ill, it took you time to get there. It doesn't happen overnight and it's going to take you time to recover and you just have to do it. You have to go through each of the steps, whatever they are for you. You have to eat, you have to move, you have to do this, but it's going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight and you just have to plod through till eventually you look back two or three months you know, previous and you'll realize how much improvement you have. You may not notice it day to day, um, but you look back over time and, and you'll see it. Anyway, so that's that's the gist. Eat real food and move. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, and how you know? Because when you Google thiamine in food, you know it'll talk about coffee. It'll talk about these other kind of things which potentially inhibit. Yeah, which are like anti thiamine, which prevent our body from absorbing it. How? Um, I guess how significant do you think that is? Do you think it's well, really significant? 
if you're someone who is already thymine insufficient and you're drinking four, five, six cups of coffee or tea a day, I think that it would behoove you to not only to get your thymine up, but to start dropping the coffee down. And at the very least, drop the coffee down or, or space out the, the thymine ingestion with the coffee ingestion so that the thymine has already been absorbed, digested, done its thing before you drink your coffee um, and, and, and try to do it that way. But yes, I think it becomes significant. Th uh, coffee, alcohol, you know, th that's the other thing folks drink. Uh, they like to drink. Well, that's not going to help your thymine status. Um, and if you are serious about getting better, you have to eliminate some of these things. Now, you don't have to go cold turkey, uh, but you need to start bringing it down and being smart and practical about how you do it. And, and ultimately, if you can get down to a lot less coffee, then you'll probably feel better. And if you get your thymine up, you probably won't need the coffee. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> how, how, long, how long would you say it takes, and I appreciate that this is probably highly individual, but how long if someone is severely thiamine deficient or is kind of on the cusp of, of a serious illness, let's say, uh, how long might it take for someone to kind of build up their stores again to start activating these systems and whatnot? Well, it could happen immediately, you know, not that they will resolve everything, but if they can get IV thymine and then they can, you know, be under a doctor's care in the event that, that they have some additional symptoms, uh, you can start seeing improvement immediately. In fact, people who do get IV who are, who are hospitalized, you know, with Wernicke's or these others, they get improvement almost immediately. It doesn't resolve everything, but you start to see improvement. And then over time, you, you unwind everything else. But if you're doing it on your own and you have to titrate up slowly, it could take you a while. It, it, it could take months. Uh, before everything starts to, to, to even out and settle down mm. because you can't take that high dose to kick everything into gear. And so what if someone, if I was being devil, devil's advocate and say, well, we're human beings and we evolved on planet Earth. We evolved to eat the food. We <laughs> didn't evolve to eat supplements. So why can't we get all of our nutrients from food? Well, we didn't evolve to eat atrazine or glyphosate <laughs> yeah. or all of the other exactly. chemicals. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's the gist Good point. of it. Um, if, if we didn't have all of that, we probably wouldn't need this. Yeah. Yeah, that makes so much sense. If, yeah, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. How, how prevalent do you think, like, thiamine deficiency is? Like, how many people just walking around out there on the streets probably have thiamine deficiency at this point. Oh, or thiamine insufficiency. They could be sure. like not quite frank. So I would say most of them, frankly. Really? I mean, if you look at the data on diabetics, so I don't know what percentage of, of the population is type one or type two diabetics, but sure. they're 70 to 80% right there uh, of all diabetics. Uh, if they're on any medications, uh, women, women are on birth control. If they're on birth control, they're thymine and variety of other B vitamin deficiencies. Um, if they eat the typical diet, they're likely thymine deficient. If, I mean, really, if anyone is on any medication chronically, uh, they're deficient because of what the, the different medications do to the mitochondria. Uh, and it, it, it they may have a sufficient diet, but the the damage to the mitochondria require more for it to perform the same functions. Right. So it, it's not say thymine deficiency in in the strictest sense. It's it's a need for more, and that's why you see people with such high doses because the damage is so bad, and it's not necessarily that now they they that they're so deficient that that uh, you know come up on the the different lab tests, but that the systems don't work. And so mm. even though they're taking this, they're only absorbing and being able to utilize a certain amount of it. And they have to overcome all the other stuff going on in the mitochondria to, to kick it into gear. And will taking high doses over time kind of upregulate those things so that they'll... That, 
Yeah, that's the thing. And so mitochondria and uh, uh, born and die regularly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and so you want a, a proportion of, of healthy to damaged that, that is favorable. And generally people have the opposite. The damaged is, is higher than the, the healthy. And that takes time to, to, to rebalance and re-regulate. And, and once you, you give the mitochondria what they need, then they start reproducing in more healthy ways and because they've unwound all the other symptoms. Um, so, yeah, so it, it's, 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 it's complicated, but in a way it's, it's very intuitive and logical. Right. Yeah. We're placed under so much stress in our modern world that it kind of makes sense. You have to counterbalance that with something. Yes. Yeah. Um, one interesting thing I'd just like to clarify, I think in the book, um, there was a study, I actually went and read this study afterwards, and it was talking about how you need you need thiamine to actually, um, for one of the enzymes which activates vitamin B6 to, to be used, oh, it's pyridoxal that, yeah. kinase. Yeah, there's, yeah. There's there's a research study saying that thiamine deficiency actually downregulated that enzyme, which you need to basically make use of vitamin B6. So a thiamine deficiency can have like downstream effects on how exactly. you're processing everything else. It's bizarre. It is, um, yeah. It, it, it goes to the point that everything's connected, and in our compartmentalized, uh, you know, p- approach to medicine. Uh, hopefully we'll go by the wayside at some point. Um, illnesses are not discrete and they're not limited to the particular body compartment that you happen to be specialized in, you know, right. the, the, the body talks to itself and at every level from the largest organ down to the smallest microorganism, everything is talking. And so um, to the extent that, that, one system is off, everything else is going to have some sort of reaction to it. And it may not be something noticeable, at least not initially, but over time, as those things accrue, you're going to start to see breaks in the system and disease. And that is something that you um, that you and Dr. Lonsdale kind of really exquisitely present in the book, I think towards the end, is this whole kind of interpret, this whole uh, kind of new paradigm, which is being taken on by a lot of the researchers, kind of relating to this bioenergetic model. So you talk about how essentially we need energy, we need biological living energy to perform everything to form all of our functions like and if anything any step of that process becomes kind of uh, blocked then it's going to have numerous downstream effects and so although we've asked you a bunch of things about thiamine i know that you know a bunch of things about another lot of things (laughs) so you cover so much in on your hormones matter website so what what else is is going wrong you know, <laughs> what would you like to talk about? What, what do you think is, is other than thiamine? Because we, I think it's clear thiamine is a problem, but you know, what else? What else? Well, I, I think you, you framed it really well in, in terms of people ask me about specific symptoms all the time and if thiamine or something else will help a specific symptom. And my answer is always yes, it will. Um, but it's to reframe the conversation that the reason you have these symptoms is because something's not working somewhere. Um, And that's your individual expression of that weakness. Um, And so, um, you know, everything that I have learned about medication reactions um, has been that it it lands in the mitochondria, (laughs) but that you can have um, different medications end up with the same damage and different medications that have entirely different mechanisms of action that shouldn't be able to damage in a similar pattern to each other end up doing damage. For example, thyroid, thyroid gets damaged. Whenever there is a medication adverse event, 
or adverse reaction. Doesn't matter what medication it is. The thyroid is like the canary in the coal mine. It is always damaged. It always, almost always ends up in Hashimoto's um, if it persists long enough. Every now and again, you get graves with the hyperthyroid, but it's like a 95.5% breakdown. But the thyroid, no matter what medication you get, if someone experiences an adverse reaction, the first thing they need to do is look at the damage of their thyroid rule in out, take care of that. Now, it just so happens that the mitochondria and the thyroid, or in the thyroid have very recip tight reciprocal relationships. So if you heal one, you heal the other. Um, but it's that crossing of boundaries that I think has been the most enlightening uh, in my work. And that's, you know, we saw this in basically every medication that I studied, the thyroid was damaged. Uh, the mitochondria, we ended up with the mitochondria as being the causative agent. Um, but, you know, it, it, it just gets us away from this, this discrete mechanisms of action away from the pharmacology as I was taught, which pharmacology is wonderful and cool and I love all the mechanisms. Um, but you've got to realize that, that if you block or increase something artificially, which is what a medication does, that it's going to have effects everywhere um, because all systems are conserved. And, and um, you know, I, I, it, it's just been it, it's been an interesting learning process to come from a traditional background, I'll, perhaps not as traditional because hormones in the brain is not necessarily what everybody studies, but kind of a traditional chemistry pharmacology background all the way to where I am now, where I use that understanding to to map systems and stuff. But I don't hold to that anymore because I understand what the mitochondria do and that everything talks to everything else and that it's all connected and there's no discrete, you know, nosological distinctions between each disease. Um, and that, that's, that, I think, has been the most important thing that I've learned in doing this. Wow. Very interesting. <laughs> It kind of, um, it reminds me of uh, the kind of, the, the way that human beings throughout the various kind of traditional healing methods, whether it be naturopathic, philosophy, Ayurveda, traditional Chinese medicine, rather than compartmentalizing the body, the, the, you know, the separate parts and kind of... A, approaching everything mechanistically so to speak actually there's this underlying kind of communication that's going on and a lot of the stuff that you're publishing on your website is is actually showing that the the recent research mm -hmm. is is completely in support of that and we got it wrong medicine got it wrong <laughs> we um, did <laughs> and yeah i think uh, i think you and the other editors and you know there's many different other websites who do a similar thing is gradually tearing it down because mm. people are starting to see that there's so many holes in the narrative um it's got to got to change at some point yeah oh um, i agree i agree and one of the things that with regard to like say natural medicine whether we, we talk ancient medicine or any of that is they understood that there was a connectivity of the body itself but that there were ecosystems among ecosystems. So the other flaw, and I think in Western thought, is that somehow we're separate from the environment we live in and that we can do stuff to the environment and it somehow magically is not going to affect us. Um, and it's this like insane amount of compartmentalizations and boundaries. Uh, and I, I think if we're to evolve, if we're to survive all of the, chemis the, the chemistry that is hanging out in the environment right now and we're pouring into our bodies, we've got to get uh, those experts from the different fields looking at the totality of the different ecosystems, you know, and talking to each other. You know, I, I, I do work sometimes on, on bugs and bacteria, and it's not something I ever thought I would be. I was not interested in any of that. I mean, I was human, 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 had no interest whatsoever in, you know, 
anything else. Uh, but again, things evolve, and you realize that that the expression of, of disease processes and other species and other organisms is is though a little bit different is very similar to us and so you've got to start looking at the patterns across different ecosystems just one more question on my end um chandler is you were talking about medications before and i it's just come to my mind i didn't want to forget um Essentially, if someone was taking a medication, if they're taking a medication that they don't necessarily have any choice about, um, perhaps they've got some kind of condition which they require to take it long term, and we know that it's probably depleting thiamine. I know that you can't give any medical advice on this show, but what what are your thoughts on kind of um, supplementing with thiamine just as a precaution. Um, I agree you should. I think you need to compensate, particularly if you know that, that, that that's a system. I mean, everybody's deficient. So yes, I would, I would say yes, you need to, to, to supplement with that and probably a number of other nutrients and optimize their health nutrition as much as you can, that foundation. So perhaps even if they have to take the medication chronically, perhaps the dosage can change, you know, or perhaps they will feel better on it, you know, because that's ultimately what you want. You want to live a life and feel healthy. You do not want to feel fatigued and run down and, you know, have all of these pains. And so you want to be healthy. Uh, so that to the extent that you can help them with that by maximizing their nutrition and reducing any other toxic exposures, then I, I think that's a win. Yeah, that really makes sense the way that you just put it. Um, right. So I, um, I think I'd like to know, have you got anything, you said that you're writing a book. Um, but have you got anything else coming up in the future, like any events or anything that you'd like to share with the listeners? Um, anything that's going on for you or, um, you know? No, nothing exciting. I'm deep in the trenches of research. I'm actually writing two books right now. Oh. Uh, one is well. the one I mentioned called Not Quite Fatal, and it's it's medical ethics, toxicology, uh, you know, kind of a hard look at all that we've done to ourselves and the environment and, and the reasons why we've allowed it to happen. Um, and the other is, uh, has a working title of how to heal from almost anything, um, uh. is more of a, a broad based, uh, approach of, uh, uh, health and healing after a lifetime of, of, you know, after living a life yeah. that lands you uh, in some sort of illness. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a, hopefully will be a, a less intense guidebook than the, the thiamine book. Although I think the thiamine book is written for a, an educated lay audience. That was my goal. Uh, but the title and some of the chemistry is a little scary. So I'm hoping to, to kind of tamp that down a little bit, make it a little bit more accessible. <laughs> Yeah, that well, that that sounds fantastic. Um, when when are you hoping to have? Oh. have <laughs> Everybody loves that question. We'd like to we'd like to get you on. Like the show it now. <laughs> I'm still in the beginning chapter, so we've got at least a year, if not more. Uh, right. Okay. Um. And where can our listeners find you? Where you, you oh. do a lot of writing for Hormones Matter, yeah? So Hormones Matter is 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 my site, and so uh, that's the best way to find me. Um, and then certainly on, on Facebook, you all can find me there. Uh, we have a Facebook group, a private group called Understanding Mitochondrial Nutrients, um, if you'd like to, to look into that. And that's primarily research. And, you know, we basically do what the group says. We look at the different nutrients, how they act and who needs what, where, when, and how. Um, and then on the, on the, <laughs> on the personal side, on the powerlifting side, uh, I have a website called old ladies lift. Um, oh, that's serious. Okay. And a group of a similar name, a private group on Facebook of that too, for all the women who are older and lifting heavy weights. <laughs> That's great. Fantastic. 
Fantastic. Right, uh, and there's also a YouTube channel for that one now. Yes, we, we added a YouTube channel. I mean, that was just kind of a, a fun project I did because uh, I'm lifting and in, in any given meet, there aren't that many older women. And I thought there's got to be more of us around the world. And I think we have about 1,400 now in the group. Wow. Um, and, you know, a lot of 60, 70-year-old women who are just – <laughs> phenomenal amounts of weight and it, it blows me away and it's it's a it's a lot of fun that was just a kind of a fun yeah for the listeners i uh i would definitely recommend checking that out because it's phenomenal <laughs> yeah it's uh, <laughs> really impressive like serious um, yeah we want to change the paradigm there too you know uh, who's you know i you guys are young um but so you you don't know this but women of my age group uh, in the U.S. in particular, uh, uh, grew up before and were athletes or attempted to be athletes before uh, legislation called Title IX uh, came into be that said that they had to let women into equal number of sports in, in high school and colleges. Prior to that, there were, you know, nothing. And so women were not allowed in gyms and, and on different teams and this and that until that legislation. But all of us grew up before that. Um, and a lot of us have come to uh, uh, lifting, this powerlifting sport in particular, as old ladies, as 40, 50, 60 year olds and starting from zero. To, and I thought, there's got to be some other people doing this. And apparently it's a very popular thing. And and wow. so it's, it's quite impressive that these women who have lived a life and had their children, some of them have grandchildren, come and start doing powerlifting and, and, you know, or squatting 300 pounds or deadlifting 300 pounds. And wow. you know, it's like, <laughs> wow, not something. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, we're going to change that. So you're told you can't build strength as as an older woman. Well, that's just not true. Yeah, apparently <laughs> so, not. Squatting 300 pounds, not. my God. Yeah, <laughs> I know, it's right? Impressive. It's, it's very impressive. I can't squat 300. I can pull. <laughs> I can deadlift, but uh, my squatting is a little less than. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, so that's just a fun project. But it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a part of, uh, you know, my overall philosophy is that, that, you know, you have to eat well, but you also have to move. You have to do something. You cannot be inactive because it's, you know, you use it or lose it, frankly. And, and you have muscle loss is, is a huge factor in illness. Um, and so uh, maybe we'll spur some change in that area too. Well, Great. Chandler, it has been absolutely amazing having you on honestly (laughs) it has been um you know it's been an honor i I really wish you the best in writing your new books um i think what the work that you're doing is absolutely fantastic on hormones matter you know there's loads of people who see so much benefit from the articles that you guys post um you know your book is fantastic for the technically minded, I, w- I will say f- probably for the layman, they, they might find it a bit difficult. Um, but I would say that you, even if you are a layman without any education, I think you should still buy the book because even for those who don't have um, sort of technical knowledge and bio- biology, most of the book is still completely understandable. And quite frankly, you can skip over the technical part. <laughs> yeah, I mean, many people well, yeah, do that. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, that's, we, we had hoped to do that. We needed to give sufficient research for physicians and researchers and, you know, back everything up. But that's why we have so many case studies in the book, too, is for the lay person. And, and we tried really, really hard to make it accessible and to tell the story uh, that someone who needed to treat themselves or that needed to learn this and convince their physician to, to, to look at it could read. And, and that, that was the goal. Yeah. And I think you just did an exquisite job at, at that. Um, and, um, yeah, uh, thanks again for coming on the show. I really wish you the best of luck with everything. And it's been, a it's been a pleasure to have you on. Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed it as well. Thanks very much. Yeah, this was great. Okay, everyone. So um, thank you for tuning into this week's show and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.